Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who might not know me, I'm John Lowe. I have the, the great pleasure of chairing the Trust. And I'm very pleased to see so many people here this afternoon in such difficult circumstances and not very pleasant weather. And there are also lots of people watching at home. So welcome to all of you at home as well. For those of you who are here, a couple of domestic arrangements. We're not expecting any fire alarms. So if there is one, it's for real. You can obviously exit the way you came in, but there is also another exit door at the back on the, on the top of the steps. Toilets, if you should need them, are one floor down. Could I ask people at home, just a small point, to turn off their microphones so that that will help the sound quality, I believe. Now this trust bulletin, bulletin 93, uh, contains quite a lot of information about initiatives to improve the riverbanks. And we specifically asked Martin to give this talk as a way of raising awareness about these initiatives. On Thursday, I attended a meeting convened by the Parish Council and chaired by Trust Member Carol Latin. Well, the purpose of the meeting was to bring together people who regularly, regularly use the river in order to coordinate activities such as litter picking and clearing the weirs. And it was a fascinating group of people representing the Weir Rivers Trust, the kayak and rowing clubs, the regatta, Brown's Boats, Durham University's volunteering coordinator, and county councillors Ormerod and Wilkes. Also there was Tim Hudson, a new trust member with river management expertise, and I know he's watching at home. And he also attended to represent Martin Hiles, another new trust member, I don't, I don't, haven't yet met Martin. I don't know whether he's here today. It doesn't look like it, but I hope he's watching. And Martin is an internationally recognized expert in river management. And he's been given the task of developing an information hub, a closed Facebook page to be set up by Councillor Ormerod to coordinate all these activities. So that's very encouraging for the future of the river in Durham. We're here today to learn about the past of the riverbanks in Durham. And we'd, we're going to be addressed by the distinguished architectural historian, Martin Roberts. Martin's an honorary member of the trust and responsible for the recently revised and considerably expanded third edition of the County Durham Pevsner. Martin is not only an expert in buildings, but he also takes a particular interest in old gardens, not least old Durham gardens. So we couldn't have a better guide to tell us, to tell us about the riverbanks of the Durham Peninsula, from defensive moat to romantic landscape. Martin. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's quite a tall order, it's got a big subject, uh, the riverbanks. Uh, I'll try and cover it chronologically. It's kind of based on a, a paper I wrote some years ago in a book which maybe some, it had disappeared a bit without trace called Northern Landscapes. It was a publication following a, uh, a sort of multi period landscape uh, conference, um, and we all submitted papers afterwards. And it, it, so the kind of chapter headings rather reflect the way I divided up the history of the riverbanks, so you have to excuse that. Um, while I'm on about publications, I will mention this again, I bring it out every year. Uh, you've all got a copy, but if you've any, uh, any space left in, in your uh, stocking fillers, uh, this is available, Nairn's County Durham, uh, all proceeds to all Durham Gardens, it's a fiver. Um, okay, the riverbanks. Uh, you can kind of conveniently drip, it's, it's essentially two, two elements, if you like, the medieval landscape, of, of, the, of the border fortress, of a castle and a defensible moat, and latterly the romantic landscape from about 1750 onwards. There's a kind of period in the middle 
when it's in transition, and that's in some ways quite the most interesting period. And um, also to some extent, it's a period we don't know a great deal about. There's one century, I always find it's a bit of the dark ages in, in Durham City's history. Um, but let's take broadly speaking, the, the, the arrival of St. Cuthbert in 995 and uh, uh, round about the Reformation, dissolution of the Priory and so on, the cathedral and Priory and so on. Um, this is uh, the castle. The ca we don't have any city walls, of course, in Durham, despite first edition OS always showing city walls. Um, we, have, we have town walls around the marketplace, and we have a castle wall, unlike Tynemouth, which embraces not only the castle, but it also the church as well, and the priory. Um, that's the central focus uh, of how the riverbanks was treated uh, for essentially the first 500 years of its history. Um, defense, 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 defense. Forget, and, and you, you're all very knowledgeable on Durham, but I mean, if anybody had come to Durham and I was speaking to them afresh, <coughs> I would have to say to them, just forget the trees. Forget about trees until mid 18th century, uh, late 18th century, uh, and think in terms of this being a castle. Uh, and if you think of any castle, uh, you need a moat, ideally. You've got a moat, it's the River Weir, uh, and uh, you would need to keep your banks free of vegetation. You want clear sight from your castle walls uh, down to the moat and up the other side. So essentially, um, we have to think about uh, uh, bare riverbanks. Uh, and the history of the vegetation of the riverbanks is a gradual, partly um, planned uh, uh, process, partly um, just a natural revegetation of, say, disused quarries and so on. This is, I, I, uh, if, I don't know whether Gemma Lewis is here. I, I, if, I, if she is, I'll have to be apologise for my rather clumsy titling. I would call this the Bishop's Barge. There are two very similar paintings in the castle. One was very badly damaged and they restored it beautifully. This is the other one, I think. And I guess it's early 18th century, possibly very last years of the 17th century, but it essentially shows uh, a treeless landscape. Uh, you know the broken walls and, and the castle. This is the view from, from the Famigate side. So think defence, that's all we need to worry about essentially. But there were other things going on. And, uh, oh, you can't, I can, can I get rid of that top or not? Maybe I can't. Yes, okay. you can. Can you I? move the mouse away from it? Oh gosh, clever, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Richard. <laughs> Put the mouse over the other people. Can I, or can I get rid of them as well? No well, disrespect. If you put it on top, maybe a, yeah, just hover over them and then click on the minus at the left, top left hand corner. Oh, I see. Oh, I got you, got you, got you. Let's come again. Hang on. Oh, there, there you go. go. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no disrespect, you all. Um, okay, defense. Uh, but there were other things going on. Uh, this is a practical. Um, utilitarian riverbanks, forget about it looking rather nice and having aesthetic considerations, think of what else was going on. The first thing, and, and I'm really in this, uh, this is Girton's uh, lovely watercolour, <laughs> we need to forget about the bridge, forget about the castle and forget about the, it's the weir I really wanted to illustrate here, because there is an interrelationship which I've never quite fully worked out, and that basically there were fords across the river before there were bridges, and then, so, so for example, when you're building Dunham Cathedral, bringing the stone from Marjorie Lane allotments, uh, you're going to go across a ford, you've got no bridges. 1093, you, you've got no bridges in the city. So that coming across, let's say, a ford here, vaguely to the base of, of, uh, of Silver Street. Um, but as the town expands, as the boroughs expand, there is a provision of mills needed. Mills need weirs, okay? Um, you also need, from a defensive point of view, if you're relying on your castle having a moat, you need a wet moat all the 12 months of the year, 365. Um, and if you don't have weirs or if you don't have any way of managing water, then there's a distinct possibility the river would dry up in dry seasons. If you have a dry riverbed, you've completely denuded your, 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 your you completely exposed yourself rather to, to, to the defensive, uh, you, you dismantle your defensive fortifications. People can simply walk across the riverbed effectively. So having a level <coughs> body of water throughout the year and there's two weirs here, and of course there's one at keep here as well, having these kind of steps almost uh, that enable you to have a deep water around the peninsula uh, uh, is, is vital if you want to ensure defensive uh, fortifications with, with a wet moat. Um, and of course you need them for the mill anyway. But of course as soon as you do that and you raise the level of the river, you flood your fords, and we'll ford at Elbert Bridge and a ford at, at Framelgate Bridge. So you have to provide bridges. So the three are interrelated, that's the simple point I'm making. It's effectively, it's town planning. Somebody realized that it would improve the fortifications, it would provide all the mills with weirs and bridges in the long term would be better for an emerging city. And I guess Flambard is the man, the early 12th century, 
a bishop who was reinforcing the walls, doing major rebuilding, moving major people populations off the palace screen into the new marketplace. All of that suggests a sort of a single plan, if I want of a better word, and, and maybe that's flambard. But those interrelationships are really rather interesting, I think. There was quarrying going on. Uh, long ago, it was thought that uh, I think cathedral stuff came from Kipia or further north up Brass Sideway. I think the thought now is it certainly comes from off the, off the riverbanks proper, but in the Marjorie Lane allotment, was it uh, Tony Johnson and um, oh, Sir Kingsley Dunham who effectively put together the, the block of Durham Cathedral as a piece of stone, added in 10% and dropped it neatly into the whole of Marjorie allotment and said, this works. Um, but immediately around the riverbanks were other places as well. Uh, below South Street, uh, where are we? Here was the Great Quarry. It's not evident quite where it was. There was certainly a, a man called John de Ulkeston who held a quarry in South Street in 1314. We know this from the prior account rolls. The dell is more easy to identify. It's this one of them, which carves its way almost back to Durham School and that road. It kind of cups, great cup in the landscape there. Um, that was a sacrist quarry, and it was significant because it, Philstone was quarried there. And Philstone is, is a stone, it, it's a normal carboniferous sandstone. It's nothing uh, interesting in a geological sense, apart from the fact that it comes out in, in very fissile form. You can split it very easily by the stone paving, or more specifically, more usefully, I would thought, for stone slates. Most of the priory slates, stone slates, come from Esh in that area. But there was a source closer to the uh, peninsula, I suspect this was robbed out very soon because they were using Esh for quite a long time. And if you still drive now from, go up oh, towards Hamilton Road, uh, Esh winning up there, and then go over the top to Bransworth, you'll see all the dry stone walls have very thin wall stones, as if they are easy to fissile and easy to split and convert into stone slates. But there was a source very close to the riverbanks. Um, I believe Palmer's Garth is a corruption of almoners, and that there was a quarry somewhere around here. There's certainly one documented in the account rolls. And we shouldn't forget this one or somewhere in here, and it does show up on the 1857 OS map. Um, the Bishop Cousin was using a broken walls quarry, a, a, a bit cheeky really. I mean, most of this was quarried out anyway, uh, but really digging quite close under the um, under the city wall, uh, castle walls rather, um, I think for, uh, for, for the library. Uh, but that, uh, I think he had to stop at some point because he was getting quite close to the, to the walls themselves. Um, we won't dwell too much on sewage, but suffice it to say, uh, there was no pleasant walks around the, uh, the peninsula in the, uh, uh, in the medieval period. Um, this is that lovely grisaille painting at Durham Castle, um, which obviously shows the Galilee Chapel here. And these two buildings, well, the one on the, the right is the surviving toilet block, basically, which, is, which is, it coincidentally was what was happening next door, because this building, the one on the left, is the great rarer daughter, the great uh, rarer daughter to the dormitory. And so this is the current toilet block, ladies here, gents here, and so on. You'll know when you come out of uh, underneath the, the between the, uh, the bookshop and the, uh, the refectory. Um, this is the line of the great rarer daughter. And if you walk down here, uh, the point is very easily made that sewage, there's a vast uh, uh, orifice, uh, sorry, about here, a great kind of cloak and maxima, great arch, uh, late 12th century, no, mid-12th mid century arch, which discharged all the effluent from the dormitory with 100 odd monks or whatever it was in their new dormitory. This is their second dormitory. The original one was in the East Range. This is the brand new one in the West Range. And the reason it was here, quite simply, was you could then put a dormitory, you know, a rarer daughter out there <laughs> and discharge, I think, down the riverbanks. You can't do that in the East Range. It, it's, it's a bucket and spade job, to, be, to put it bluntly. And all the buildings that developed down here into the uh, other <laughs> priory buildings, residential buildings, the infirmary to the north uh, and these buildings to the south. You can see a whole series of individual uh, garderobe outshoots uh, uh, at the base of the wall here. So, it, and basically we're just making the place. This was not a pleasant place to walk. It was never intended to be any aesthetic or spiritual experience. It was simply a convenient way of dumping rubbish and so on. Um, there were, however, some gardens. Um, there is an interesting study to be done in medieval gardens on the cathedral. I, I just went through the priory account rolls once, just kind of dotting out what one could gather. And individual obedientiaries, the individual officers of the cathedral, had um, different gardens of their own. Um, 
and it's not easy to know where they were. Most of them, of course, were, were, and were off here, basically, they're at West Orchard, which is Marjolaine allotments. Marjolaine allotments seem to have decayed into an allotment area, possibly taking in part of what is now St. Margaret's churchyard. Um, and that whole area was where their major, their major sort of expansive uh, space for gardening and dovecuts and fish ponds and so on are recorded. On the peninsula, you can understand it's very limited. Of course, their major farm was the other side, Albert Hall in Holgar Street. Uh, so what developed quite reasonably was through the little posting gate at the end of South Australia <coughs> was, a, was a ferry service, which was basically on the line, pretty much of the current uh, Prevence Bridge or thereabouts. Uh, uh, and, and that was satisfactory during the medieval period when it clearly you didn't want to build a bridge because that would completely broach your, breach your, your security arrangements. But we do know of two specific uh, garden areas, and, and this is very tentative, but I mean, and it's not clear this is on the slopes beyond the, the back gardens of the, um, of the Bailey properties, on the slopes going down, quite an early stage, there was colonization by medieval gardens. This one is at the back of St. Chad's. These are the, the first six buildings of St. Chad's, south of Bow Lane, are mentioned in a document of 1806 as having been the infirmary's garden. Um, this is St. John's, it's actually, uh, what I've indicated is the big garden of the Bowes family, and I wonder whether that, as a parcel of land was what the Bows acquired when they not only obviously occupied their own property at Four South Bailey, but took a great chunk of garden as well. And we'll come on to that later. And was that a single plot that was occupied by the, the, uh, uh, the cellar, the cellar who was responsible for provisioning of food and so on in the monastery. So he needed a big garden, as did the infirmary, of course, herbal gardens, medicinal herbs and all the rest of it. Um, this is the Chad's one. And basically this is the 1857 OS map gorgeous thing. You can look at this forever. It's an amazing set of maps for, for the whole country. This, of course, is the Bailey. Bow Lane is about here. That's the, well, they call it the city wall. That's the castle wall. And the river is about down here. And it's on these slopes, either on the slopes or on the flat. There is, as you know, at the back of John's and Chad's, there are paddocks, paddocks where the boat houses are. I wonder whether they cultivated right down there, because periodically, surely it would flood and you'd lose your garden. So maybe they cultivated the lower slopes in the medieval period where you're above uh, the, the risk of flooding and so on. Uh, it, it certainly shallows out that, that curve coming down the bank. This is, um, uh, this is John's and there is an intriguing little path here, which I think is, is the line of the old Exchequer route. It would have gone through a little postern gate, it would have had to, but that little doorway there, A, it upsets the symmetry of this rather nice building. Um, and that seems to be reflected in this strange compartment, which is still exists. I, I, I remember when I went, several years ago and St. John's students were doing great things. They were creating amphitheaters and performance spaces out here. I said, for God's sake, don't get rid of this. It looks strange because it's a narrow compartment and you can't actually get into it. But I think it's a kind of fossilized route down to here, which is the paddock at the bottom of, of the lower part of the slopes of uh, St. John's. Um, and that is the, the cellarer's access uh, uh, to, to his gardens. And again, there would be some very modest breach in the wall. Um, and this, of course, is part of the great Bowes Garden of, of the 18th century. So, I mean, as we leave the medieval period, let's just think defence, mills, quarries, sewage, primary gardens, I mentioned. Buildings, I would simply say, if buildings were needed, they were built. There is a process from the sort of 18th century onwards where you're seeing the riverbank as a different kind of landscape, as an aesthetic experience, and that if a building has a utilitarian purpose, but also um, a visually significant, uh, an eye catcher in the landscape, like the mills, for example, they would be retained. I mean, I don't think you'd want to get rid of the mills anyway, but there were there are dotted around, and you look at any, look at a Woods map or some of the, the, the mid 18th century maps, there, and you'll see little buildings dotted around. They're little houses, I don't know what they are, um, uh, but they, they, they have gradually been taken out. And what's come back in, with one exception, which we'll discuss later, significant building, uh, the boat, the boat, uh, uh, the boat houses have come back for the colleges, but with that exception, <coughs> what has been left are buildings that have some purpose in the landscape, the mills, the count's house and so on. Uh, so there's been a sort of thinning out of, of, of uh, um, non-essential buildings in, in a visual sense. Middleshire is a kind of convenient name. It, it comes from a book um, about Northumberland in the sort of 16th and 17th century. It's, it's really simply condensing the fact that you know, uh, literally from the mid 16th century, almost certainly with the two um, uh, critical dates of 1603 and 1707, when we were further bound into the Scottish nation, 
the whole idea of, of Durham as a, a border county facing the, 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 the hostile Scots disappears and evaporates. And the process of how that we get from that point um, to, to certainly say early 18th century is really interesting. And um, one can see it in various processes going on in the city. Um, the first half of this, I find the 1550, 1650, or 1540, 1660, I suppose, that, that century is a bit of a dark age, I often think, in, in, in Durham's history. Um, it, it's very interesting, from, not a great deal of architecture going on. From 1660 onwards, we have a, seem to have a lot more documents. We have cousin doing things and then documenting them as well. Um, but there seems to be a bit of a, a period when, uh, and I'm sure that stuff was going on, and we know certainly inside the cathedral and Nordian reforms and all that, in the early 17th century, that was going on. But in other respects, the development of the city is a bit unclear, certainly as regards basic buildings. Um, so hence the sort of the first century is a, is a question mark. The defences were certainly compromised quite early on. I mean, because there was a bridge. This is, this is Patterson's map of 1585. That ferry service that occupied, that operated down here, which was fine if you were a medieval castle, because you, were, you weren't building a permanent bridge, they did build a permanent bridge in 1574, which is Prevence Bridge One. Um, and this, as far as we know, and it, it's shown there as a pathetic little jetty type thing, it looks about three foot wide, and I think it's just notional. But I mean, it was a building, it was a bridge that had stone abutments, and it had a timber superstructure, that we know. So it was a substantial bridge. So it was there, it, it, I don't know whether it had things like drawbridges on it or whatever, or whether by 1754, for whatever reason, in the middle of the Elizabethan period, they felt safe. They felt it was not needing to be that citadel against the Scots quite so much. There was also significantly a bridge called Bow Bridge, which is effectively where Kingsgate Bridge is now, but right at the bottom. And I'm not clear about this. It's it's said to be late medieval, which it seems to me if it's a bridge and it's late medieval, then that's even an earlier compromise on the defences of the, of, of the peninsula. Um, was it late medieval? <laughs> it's certainly mentioned in a book which June Crosby alerted me to, and I was, I, a fond memory, June, um, Dobson's Dry Bobs, which probably many of you will have read or not. It's, it's an account, it's a fictitious account of, I think it's late, I'm very late 16th, a very early 17th century, recalling Durham and it talks about certainly late 16th century Durham in terms of buildings it's the entire action is set in the city and she said that's a very good source if you believe every word and it is a work of fiction in essence but the setting of it is late 16th century Durham uh, and it mentions the Bow Bridge um, so you know it's, it's conceivable it could be a 1570 1580s bridge if it's late medieval that suggests that a, a degree of compromise on the defences which is quite surprising I think and as I say, what else? It's just a bit of a, a grey area. What we do know about is Durham Castle, and, and then we're on surer ground in knowing what, uh, well, Bishop Cousin did. And, and this is, there's a bit of a question mark here, and, I'll, 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 and Adrian may well uh, say I'm wrong or whatever, but we, I mean, we know that Bishop Cousin was a great publicist, I think. Uh, he, he, he recorded stuff. He sometimes said he built things he didn't, he just repaired them, but anyway, and he documented how much he spent on buildings and so on and so forth. That's jolly helpful, and there are certainly day books which record works on the castle, the castle grounds. They're jolly helpful, and there are wonderful contracts for Auckland and, and Durham uh, for his craftsmen. Um, but always remember, Cousin was here for 12 years, Crew that followed him was here for 48 years, and we seem to know very little about Crew. Um, Crew, we know, for example, and I'm going to show you some gardens here that uh, look over the riverbanks uh, in the castle. A crew certainly created a new garden in the castle. It's there in his biography. I can't find the note as the source for that remark, but he was showing some of his guests in the castle around um, the new garden. So it's got to be one of these which we sometimes attribute to Cousin, because Cousin is the louder voice, if you know what I mean. Um, well, there's the castle and the sort of area. So I suppose we, we won't talk about any internal gardens. Interesting, though, the Alex were talking about the riverbanks. So the main interest here is, is on Bishop's Walk, um, North Terrace, which has a, a perspective beyond uh, the castle itself and to some extent just mentioning the mot because we're moving in garden terms from an appreciation of gardens intimate gardens in enclosed spaces the, the medieval garden was essentially enclosed cloistered sequestered sort of garden um, and increasingly there is an outlook which is taking us beyond the garden and saying well there's something good over the wall 
that uh, I mean, later on in the 18th century, they say we've um, gardens and leapt over the fence and all nature was a garden. This was a sort of remark in the, in the English landscape uh, period in the 18th century. But they're beginning to appreciate that there are views beyond simply the controlled garden of a formal parterre. Let, let's say the upper garden at Old Durham, for example, there's no view out of the cathedral from the upper garden at Old Durham. You have to go into the terrace to see that wider landscape. Um, and so this was emerging uh, in the late 17th century. So uh, this, is, and um, I must, I, well, uh, I was hearing about Roger Norris saying recently, so I must thank Roger for this. Roger first put me uh, into the way of this amazing document. I think Palace Green Library had a negative version of it when I first saw it. Um, I got a positive version of it from, from uh, 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 Bodgan Library, where it is, it's the earliest representation of, of uh, the city from Winnie Hill. This is zoomed in on the castle, and, and for various reasons I won't go into now, although it, it could be sort of 20 or 30 years on the side of that date, I think 1665, I'll suggest it could be that date, really on the basis of this being an untamed, you know, mot, wild mot, nobody's done any work on it. Um, the, the, the possible undermining factor is that, that there's no evidence here below. This is Hatfield. This is just the edge of St. Mary Le Beau. This is Kingsgate Postum. That the riverbanks was in any way cultivated. Um, I'm not sure that would necessarily be true. I have made doubts about Hatfield because John Heath IV lived at Hatfield before he moved to Old Durham. And I wonder whether Hatfield's car park at the back isn't an early terrace, um, particularly as his house was right overlooking it. You know, if you've got a house on the Bailey, you don't need to worry too much about what you're doing at the riverbanks in the, uh, uh, in the 17th century. Um, but if you're living on the on the city on the castle wall, uh, as he was, um, maybe you do. Um, but let's anyway look at this mot. Basically, we know from uh, Cousins' day books uh, that uh, I think John Forder is the man who's actually digging the paths out in 1665 to create these three paths. Uh, and in 1666, early on, as any good gardener would do, having got the basic modelling right, he's planting groziers and roses. Uh, around the uh, uh, around the paths and on the banks, and we're trying to get hold of groziers and gooseberry bushes. And I, let me just tell you that trying to get hold of soft fruit bushes of authentic date is difficult. You can do most things at Old Durham in terms of getting herbaceous plants and trees. There's plenty of specialist nurseries. Very very few seem to do uh, white currants, red currants, black currants, um, and gooseberries, which we're desperate to plant in the lower garden. Uh, but we haven't given up yet. Um, but uh, I'd love to be able to get hold of the same grosier variety that Cousin was planting on the banks of the, uh, of the castle. That would be, that would be great fun. Um, North Terrace is my kind of best bet for a possible crew garden. I mean, there's no reason why it couldn't be Cousin at all. Uh, it certainly appears in all these uh, wonderful paintings that the castle have got, which are all a kind of, well, again, late 70s, really right up to 1700 thereabouts and into the first 20 or 30 years of the 18th century. Uh, this is that um, wonderful uh, grisaille again. It's got sash windows, that's the critical thing. Now, uh, to give you a kind of a, a fix, the earliest sashes around here, well, Carlisle, is about 1695, I think. Uh, the earliest in Durham is about 1704, which is Croxdale. Um, and you kind of think, don't you, that if anybody had sash windows of the new innovation, it would be the bishop first. Uh, so this could be around about 1700. It couldn't be 1680, put it that way. Um, uh, and certainly some of these other features suggest um, it's around that 10 or 20 year period. And North Terrace appears um, a, more of a panorama over the city. But again, the very fact that, that they are saying we're, we're not content with our enclosed gardens and our formal, the gardens we can almost control the design of, we want to see the wider landscape. And this is part of it. And, and on top of the bastion, which you know is that you can see at the back of Saddle Street, they've even got a nice little pretty circular garden and a little, I know, stone or marble table in the middle of it. And all the walls are beautifully decorated. Uh, these, these are, as we'll see, are brick walls with stone dressings. Uh, and then we'll see it better. But and the most amazing feature is a balcony coming out of the back of the Great Hall in the castle. And if you know the castle then, it was the Great Hall, but there was a suite of rooms at the end where there's the high table now in the castle. Uh, and the bottom one was called, I think, the Black Chamber or something. It was a kind of private room of cousins, or maybe Neil, I don't know, but it was a darkly panelled room. So I always think the idea of going into the Great Hall, being invited into the more intimate Black Chamber, and then cousin or crew or maybe even Neil saying to you, oh, come and have a look at the view, and you step out onto this very precarious balcony, which I'll show you, it's only got one support as far as I can see. Um, there it is, it's got, it's got one post. 
and you, you emerge from the base of the window, as it were, and you get this amazing landscape. So the sense of going from a big space to a confined space to a big space must be quite scary. Um, and here is, and then this is my favorite castle painting, Bar None. Um, this is showing in color uh, what is red in brick, new brick, uh, very new to Durham, relatively speaking, in the late 17th century. So bright red for that. White is render, brown is stone. So that's very helpful in seeing that here we've got a stone base wall, we've got brick on top, and we've got some white copings and ball finials and all the rest of it. Um, lots of good detail and stacks of good detail in the town as well. Needs serious research, but first of all, the university needs to take a decent photograph of it. Um, I found when I did the university book, in order to get a decent photograph of the, the um, St. Mary's College proposal, they have to take it off the wall and they've got a wonderful person who will lay it flat on the wonderful scanner like the size of a small football pitch and, and that used to be in the basement of the exchequer building didn't it i think it's moved now um but this really you can't photograph it on the black stairs at all because it's got heavy varnish on it and i so hence this is an appalling uh, photograph of mine um but it needs to be scanned properly digitized put it back on the wall and then we can all look at it on our computer in great detail i mean sir john duck's house is here little gazebos Loads of stuff going on, uh, which, and, and that way we could date it. If we date this, look at this one, look at the Bishop's Barge one, look at the Grisai one. We, I'm sure we, if we know what's going on in Durham around about 1700, 1720, we should be able to put tighter dates on, the, on, on these paintings. This is, and I'm sorry, let's go back. And what, what this is showing you is three gardens, actually, three, three gardens that are beginning to look out over the river. This is North Terrace. This is Bishop's Walk, which we'll look at next, and we'll come on to look at um, uh, Prevence Walk. This is Bishop's Walk, which is just the other side of what is now Fellows Garden, uh, ignored in, in previous university sort of regimes. Uh, it was a dumping ground for archaeological waste uh, when Martin Leyland did his dig in the, um, uh, in the castle courtyard donkeys years ago, um, and it's unkempt. But I say that conscious of the fact that the present uh, management and principle and uh, uh, Certainly, uh, Gemma are very keen to look at their gardens, um, particularly North Terrace at the moment, because of issues relating to Durham Castle Chapel that need work on it and, and needs to be opened out. Um, and North Terrace potentially is a, is a great space. And I also think, from an economic point of view, it's good for Durham Castle that if they've got a big event, a conference, or whatever going on inside, they could offer an external gardens tour as a sort of cheaper alternative. So they could have two events going side by side. Um, but they've got they've got the richness of gardens. Whether they go the way I love to think they could go the way of Old Durham and do some authentic planting it doesn't really matter. I think if you see North Terrace, it just needs some tender loving care at the moment. Anyway, this is uh, Bishop's Walk, important because it's the first garden to go outside the castle walls. Uh, a deliberate policy here to say, and then we're talking 1660 onwards, as we'll see shortly, or 1665 onwards to say that the, 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 the function of the castle as a defensive fortress is redundant. Therefore, we can do what we want. We want to look over the castle wall anyway, but we can actually put a garden outside the castle wall and it doesn't compromise defences in any way. Um, so this is it. It runs on the back of what is now the, the, the Pace extension to Palace Green Library. It was originally crenellated, uh, again, stone base, brick on top. Uh, though those copings look right for the period. They're now all levelled, but I think originally one has to imagine them stepping up, as is seen here. Um, and what's significant is that this thing appears in it. Uh, this is um, a building that didn't last too long, and I'm going to show you a building that lasted even a shorter period of time, but this is gone by the mid-18th century. Um, it's sitting on the castle wall, but it ain't in any way uh, a, a remodelling of a, a medieval turret or a medieval tower. This is a brand new building added in brick, uh, it's got a stone steps going up to it, uh, but it's, it's and as you can see from the top, it, it's got windows all the way around the top. So that's clearly an observation room. This is a Belvedere. This is a, 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 an addition to the castle, uh, forgetting about anything to do with defence and towers. It's simply a Belvedere to see the wider landscape. And I would no doubt those windows went all the way around and you can look back at the cathedral and look right across at South Street as well. Um, it appears in three or four uh, different drawings and paintings. This is uh, the Bishop's Barge one. Um, pink is as close as we get to, to brick, but it give you, we can see what is clearly brick. Um, <coughs> but it's gone, and this is my kind of sketch of it. Uh, I've no idea what date it is. I mean, it's, it's not inconceivable, this is crew adding a garden, but somehow I feel it's cousin because it's certainly aligned. The, the axis of this is on the center line of, of his library. 
So that so obviously the library comes first. That was completed. Well, the, the, the extension was completed about 1670. We never we don't have a start date for the library, but um, uh, so sometime after. Um, it could be that Cousin started it and crew finished it, I don't know. Um, but it's probably later than 1670, uh, and it's on the axis, and it's, it's, it's a, I think, a really interesting building that we've lost. So there's the whole lot again in the Grisai, this is, and this is obviously taken from the station, Wharton Park, that sort of area. I haven't sort of actually, diff with, the, with the Bock one, you can actually tell he's staying on Winnie Hill. He isn't moving with the Bock one. Uh, because there are certain parts of the city you can't see. And if you line up buildings, which is great fun to do with a map, uh, and uh, line up buildings in the foreground and buildings in the background, you know that Buck stayed there all the time and drew every building. Um, Buck, I'm not so sure of, as we'll see. And this is a little bit more cruder. It's quite naive, this representation. But some of these buildings are serious. That, uh, that is Sir John Duck's house in Brick, the biggest house in Silver Street, with their own little garden and gazebo on the riverside and so on. Um, and there we have it again, North Terrace, Bishop's Walk, and, well, and then we have the copycat garden, so to speak, because whatever the bishop did, uh, the, the dean and chapter were likely to follow, or vice versa. And sure enough, they laid out Prevens Walk in 1689 and extended it in 1702. Uh, this is it on a mid 18th century representation. It, you know, you go down dark entry, basically turn left as you have to, and then when you continue down, it goes off on the level. Um, again, thank you, Roger, for reminding me that uh, this. Uh, Roger pointed out that this stone wall is, is carved with, with distances on, and he said a Victorian uh, cannon, uh, because he's got his daily exercise by rolling a garden roller up along this uh, Prevens Walk, he got uh, the, the, the cathedral masons just to mark out 10, 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, so he could do 10 or 20 yards a day and leave his roller there, and, and the marks are still there. But that is a perfect, uh, well, I say perfect, <laughs> it is imperfect, it's a, it's a perfectly looking um, uh, late 17th century terrace garden. It would, of course, been totally clear view. Forget the trees. You'd be able to look out and see a panorama, you'd be able to see South Street. So everything onto the right uh, would have been not there in the period. I think there were, and maybe because I'm out of the loop on most things in Durham the last 10 years, I mean, there was a structural problem with the walls at Prevence Walk. I know John Williams mentioned two years ago. I don't know whether they've actually done those repairs or not. What is sad, I have to see, because that was photographed a few years ago, in the last few years, the Dean of Chapter haven't cut the grass, and, and the grass is now three foot high. I dearly love them to, because I mean, although I would, in a perfect world, one would like to see that laid out with perhaps something espaliered against the walls and open from time to time. I know there's a, because there's a, I mentioned this uh, ages ago to the Dean of Chapter when I said, and very kindly, they've often allowed groups to walk or that and give me the key to open the gate. Um, they have a security safeguarding issue in relation to uh, Chorister School, which is, you could pop over the wall basically and get into chorister school around the back so there's a bit of an issue about 24 hour or 24 7 um uh, public access but i think if they could just maintain the grass then putting in a bed and putting something against the wall it might even be a project for the friends of durham cathedral i don't know um then that's so much more pleasant to walk along than the fact that you can't even walk along it at the moment uh, i don't know whether that's simply a covid thing and they will get back to cutting the grass or whether it's a, a, a limitation in terms of cutting back on funding. But it seems to me that that's very pleasant the way it is. It doesn't need all those authentic 17th, 18th century um, plants on the walls, fruit trees on the walls. They were there, clearly, you can see them in, in the illustration there. That's easily done, and put it bluntly at Old Durham, we've done all the research on it. We've got uh, fruit of exactly that <coughs> period growing on our walls. It just needs a little bit of capital. But I think for now, let's get the grass back. I think that would get, get back to a lawn. Um, so there we are. Uh, so those two need, they look to be almost painted the same time. Uh, and there are variations. So I don't think that one is copying the other, um, but one would like to just see a bit of distinction between these two paintings. There are other uh, terraced gardens. What, what all these things have got, what North Terrace, Bishop's Walk and um, the other uh, uh, Primms Walk have got is essentially a vantage point, a panorama, sloping ground over water. That's the kind of key components you get. And you get them elsewhere. You also get them at Old Durham. And the nice thing about Old Durham is it seems to predate the bishop doing it at Bishop's Walk. And you kind of think in Durham, as I said with sash windows, that the bishop would be the first to do anything and everybody else would follow. It seems that the Heath family, and these were gardeners before they were builders, they were like the Bows and the, the, um, the Burdeners at Hardwick, um, 
they would love their gardens first and didn't for, forgot generally about their house and often didn't have the money then to rebuild their houses. So maybe they were pioneering and, and, and therefore the, the bishops saw this and copied it effectively. Um, certainly the, the Heaths, who then they were at Keepia here before they moved to Old Durham, John Heath the first, second and third, I think lived here and then the fourth lived here. Um, they added a little terrace garden outside their Elizabethan walled orchard. And this little extension is to look over uh, into the, uh, the, the waters of the weir uh, and, and the mill and, and, and uh, all the sounds of the mill race and so on and so forth. So that's, a, I think, an 18th century addition. Um, as is this, which could be late 17th century, um, this is Sherbet Hospital going out to the, what is, we know is the out gardeners uh, in the early to mid 18th century. This has all the appearance of a 17th century uh, long walk. Uh, it, the annoying thing is that it's entirely built up. The dear old Victorians just allowed it to be planted up on the left-hand side. So the slope and the stream at the bottom, you cannot see. I was thinking there might've been a view across the Durham Cathedral in the distance, always looking out for eye catchers in the landscape. But I think, I think there's a hill in the way which we can't do anything about. So I think it was simply the experience of looking down on a slope and seeing the rippling stream at the bottom. I, I'd just love to go along there with a massive chainsaw and take all of those on the left-hand side out. Um, Oh, and I just have to mention this because I have corresponded with John about this. Um, and this is part of it. And this is why this is little, the tiny little thing in Durham is so rare. I've mentioned about all these little kind of filigree details of how you, you're faced with a medieval wall and you'll decorate it or, or you create a new wall at North Terrace uh, and you, you, you make it uh, more humane uh, by decorating it. And here you see fussy, fussy stone dressings. They're in stone, we can see they're in white and ball finials, all quite expensive. The kind of thing that gets um, rationalized in the 18th and 19th century, exactly as you see in the staircases. This is, this is um, St. Cuthbert's stair wonderful staircase at the bottom of the bailey. Um, and of course, in this late 17th century, it had balls on the top and it would have finials on the bottom. Very ornate. By the 18th century, not only was that out of fashion, in the case of, of places like this, it wasn't really um, a desirable from the aesthetic point of view. So they, 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 they trimmed these things off. Most staircases of this date, the ball finials, the balls and the finials disappear. The best example is Bowes House in uh, St. John's. And they did it at uh, their, the Bowes did it at their house in, in the Royal County as well. But they, they disliked these so much, they, they stripped them out. But of course, you're left with a hole on the top. So they planted a lovely little, little cap with, with acanthus leaves <coughs> uh, to mark the spot where the ball was in a much more acceptable 18th century fashion. But the nice thing about this house, it was, it was, it was never improved in the 18th century, so it's got this wonderful staircase. So this undoubtedly, I think, had balls or finials or some kind of decoration. It was rationalized in the 18th century because this tooling looks very 18th century, um, but it survives. This is Kings of Get Pots, the only bit left around the peninsula. And on the other side, it looks like this. Um, which is appalling, or oh, it did look like this rather. Uh, well, sorry, it looks like this now. It looked like that in 2007, and in 2008, the city council and Martin Lowe was a conservation officer, and I had a conversation with him about this last week. Uh, they cleared all this out because there was a tree in the corner. And would you believe there's still a tree in the corner propped up again in the last 13 years? They did massive anchoring with stainless steel to stop this corner falling out. This is on the right-hand side, obviously, this is the steps down to Kingsgate Bridge. Uh, but it's come back again, 13 years later, there's a massive tree in the corner. You know, we, it needs to be taken out and somebody needs to take responsibility for it. City Council did it then, County Council presumably would take responsibility for it now. They did that wonderful, re, you know, recobbling down, uh, down, uh, down Bow Lane. Why can't they take responsibility for this? Or is it, is, is it uh, Hatfield or whoever? I don't know, but somebody should do it because what's going to happen? We're going to repeat history again if we're not uh, going to deal with it quickly. This is Samuel Buck. Um, Again, from Winnie Hill, but it's, it's, a, um, it's not accurate in the sense if you go to Winnie Hill now, you will not see that panorama. You'll see box panorama. <coughs> but in order to, to in, in, in include all these, these details of the Riverbank Gardens, and we should be grateful to Buck for that, he's had to move forward. So he, this is an artificial perspective because all this is hidden below. I mean, otherwise, you'd imagine the river would be about 100 yards wide. Uh, this is St. Oswald's, obviously, and you can't see the lower gardens uh, and, and the river from Winnie Hill. But it's a super um, uh, uh, illustration, and I'm very grateful to the university who gave me a massive 20 megabyte copy of it, um, because then you can really zoom in and see things. This is St. John's College, uh, number three, the big Horton House, the Eden House, um, uh, something espalier against the wall, which is now Principal's Walk. 
Uh, there are turrets and so on along here as well, and at least an indication. I don't know how accurate this is or whether it's just nominal. There were terrace gardens. I can't say we could swear that every bed of these is accurate, but some of these steps are vaguely in the right position coming down from the uh, upper gardens on the bailey. Uh, and this is the garden below Hatfield. There's, there's that, um, uh, that tower, or, or tower house. It's not a tower, it's a substantial house. The only one on the bailey that's on the wall. Everything else is obviously on the bailey frontage. Something odd about this one. This is the one the Heaths lived in for a while, John Heath IV, and it's now incorporated into D stairs at Hatfield. Um, and uh, well, this is a lovely photograph that's in Hatfield, and, and this is, of course, what is now the car park. This is the dining hall, literally when it was um, uh, a sort of coaching in sort of thing. Uh, but this landscape, and we're talking kind of mid 18th century here, I think. There is, this is in the mid, I don't have I mean, no reason to doubt this isn't still there. This was taken. I guess this is Ferrand's Walk, isn't it? Which was the end of the 19th century. So maybe this is 1900, 1920, whatever. Uh, and this looks to me like, like steps down and then ramps down the side to a lower garden. It looks like a, a cascading a formal garden. And although the it's twisted, if you work that back, it actually lines up with that. If you, the view from that dining hall window, which is a magnificent window, would have looked axially down the bank here. And, and that would have been in the middle of it. So maybe in the middle of all that vegetation, there is in fact that formal garden, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's an intriguing photograph. And, and the possibility is, I say, that, that John Heath IV, the gardener of Old Durham, lived here in the 1630s and 1640s, I think. And did he do something on the riverbanks here by way of a garden? There is, as I say, that flat terrace, which is quite intriguing. Um, later in the century, we were moving into a stage when perhaps, I don't know how the sewerage was being handled and, and uh, obviously the rarer daughter had disappeared, but those, those garter robes in the Bailey were probably still operating. Uh, but it was beginning to be appreciated that this, uh, obviously they're taking views out now from 1660s onwards, they're looking and creating uh, views over the landscape and, and the, the wish to improve the look of the riverbanks. Defence is completely behind us. Um, and so St Cuthbert's Well is built in 1696 and there are a number of these wells and caves, as they're later called, dotted around uh, that create interest on a perambulation you might make around the, uh, around the riverbanks. At the same time, or at least two years later, Celia Fiennes comes. Now she is walking out to Keepia because she says nice things about the Musgraves Gardens at Keepia, and they're a kind of public resort at the time. Uh, she says the walks, are, the walks are very pleasant by the riverside. Not precisely sure where she means, but one gets the feeling that St. Cuthbert's Well has been designed with some aesthetics in mind. So maybe by this time, not all the paths we now have have been laid out, but they're beginning to be laid out, perhaps. What's certainly true, and I, I can't remember the precise property, somewhere down South Bailey, one of the property owners or, or VCs is, is taking uh, possession of one of the former turrets it's towards the back end of Cuthbert's or lower end of St. John's. Um, uh, and the reason he's doing it, obviously, is to convert it into a gazebo. If you've got a medieval turret, and these are the medieval turrets, look at that one, it's got a rather smart roof design. Um, that is because they're, they're, they're populating and, and, and occupying and gardening on the lower slopes, and they want to sit out and have their tea and look down on their new gardens. Um, so I think there's a, it's 1724, 1728, that kind of period when they're beginning to take possession of the lower gardens. And even things like coal pits, as we'll see in a later illustration, there are coal pits dotted around the peninsula, and perhaps these are being filled up uh, as part of an aesthetic process to sort of tidy up the riverbank. At the same time, as, as incidental houses, which are perhaps utilitarian, have ceased to have a value, are, are swept away, whilst as we get deeper into the 18th century, um, the, um, uh, the, the aesthetic value of some of these retained buildings is, is, is more, more important. OK, this is the last section, um, and this is a quote from, from Hutchinson, um, which takes us beyond the, the time of formal gardens. And um, I suppose it's, it's, it's summarised by this view, uh, which we've seen bits of already. Um, this, of course, is not our current Prevens Bridge. Uh, this is Prevens Bridge 2, as it were. This is the rebuild of 1696. This is taking the position of the... 1574 bridge, which was, I, if you remember, stone abutments, timber superstructure, and replacing the superstructure in stone. So that we get an entire stone bridge uh, in, uh, uh, in 1754. Um, yeah, and, and so um, that's the rebuild. Sorry, 660, I beg your pardon, 1696. 
1574 for the first one, replacing the, the ferry. 1696, the total rebuild, or at least the superstructure rebuilt in stone. Um, there are some repairs in the 1740s to raise the parapets because Thomas Shirley does it. And then, of course, we have the Great Flood, which, which and we'll cut, come to that, but that replaces the bridge further around here. Um, Prevence Walk, we've mentioned, the gardens, but essentially gardens on, on the east side and south and, and no cultivation below the castle. This is one slide to try and <laughs> cover the entire history of the English landscape garden. People start writing in the early 18th century about it, Ad Ad Addison, Pope, Kent, an appreciation of the wider landscape. We're seeing that in Durham, the views are being appreciated, but they, 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 they were seeing that, that the, the value of what they called rude countryside at the time, that taking in the wider landscape visually or actually treating one's garden less in that sort of very precise clipped Old Durham Gardens parterre sort of way and a more informal landscape is beginning to happen. This is a very early example at Rousham by William Kent. It gets much wilder uh, and more uh, expansive in scale with, with capability ground later in the century. And the, the inspiration for all these landscapes is a whole series of French and Italian painters, principally Claude Lorraine, Nicolas Poussin, and Salvador Rosa. And if you look at all the uh, inventories that people like Arthur Young make um, of when he's going around houses and he lists everybody's paintings, they're all collecting this stuff, particularly if they're into changing their own landscapes. Ralph Carr at Coppen, um, when he visits in 1770, Young lists off his paintings. He's got a couple of Salvador Rosses and a Poussin and so on. And, and these are the inspiration. And what's central to all these paintings, uh, and these are paintings admittedly 100 years before the period we're talking about, is a, a degree of dramatic topography. Cliffs and rocks are good because they are hinting at the sublime. And the sublime is an interesting 18th century concept. It's basically, well, I think the best, best description is, is Addison's. It's, it's agreeable horror. It's a sort of slightly nervousness we get when, when the landscape is not pleasant and ordinary and rather boring, and, but actually, oh gosh, it's a bit scary in some ways, and we'll come on to that. If there are objects in the landscape that can be, can be fashioned into viewpoints and so on, uh, buildings great and small, I mean, the, the, the counterplay between, you know, the, the rich man in his castle and the poor man in his gate of having a major high status monument and something quite menial, mills quite, figure quite a lot in early landscapes. Sometimes they're built, mock mills are built, uh, mock hermits caves and things like that against the Gothic ruins, which are often, if you don't have a Gothic ruin, you build one. And, and water clothed by bridges. You look at all uh, Lorraine's and, and Poussin's, a lot of a hall, a lot of them have a, a flash of water, a space of water, be it a lake or a river, and to close the view, you put a bridge at the end of it. It, it, it works aesthetically. Um, and of course, you then have to have those views framed. So you need trees to frame that view. Um, and the critical thing, which you would sometimes forget, is access to them. If you, you know, you know, painters could stand and, and make a fictitious landscape, but uh, it, where in, in, in reality, if you've got the potential to make these landscapes, you need to find a space where you can actually create the view and say, stand here, and it all works. And, and that's critical in Durham's case. This is just one Lorraine sketch. I mean, there's the bridge closing the water. There's the buildings framed in trees and dramatic topography. It, it kind of illustrates, but you look at Google away at, at Claude Lorraine <coughs> and you see the kind of things that uh, English gentry were collecting and then trying to uh, reproduce in their own landscapes. So this is this is what we start off with, really. This is this is the bare bones. This is the treeless landscape of the medieval peninsula. Um, and into this comes this man, Joseph Spence. Um, he's a cleric. He, 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 he occupies the seventh stall of Durham Cathedral. So his, his day job, if you like, is, um, uh, is to do business in the cathedral. He lives in, in Surrey. He comes up for the, you're, you're, I think you're required to come up for six weeks in the summer. He stayed for most of the summer uh, to do his business here. Uh, he lived in the college, but he also, his, his, um, his prebendal, estate included Finkel Priory and, and the farmhouse at Finkel, he added, a, a, if you go to Finkel, the farmhouse, the bit at the end with the bay window is Spence's addition, so they could look across at what he called the sequestered walks of Cocken. Cocken's terribly important. Um, and what he found, I suppose, was he had that Durham, and he was, he, was, he was appointed almost certainly in part because of his landscape experience, because when he wasn't doing the day job, he was a very noted landscape designer. He was a good friend of Alexander Pope. He knew all of these people and this and so on. And um, I'm almost certain that, that uh, Trevor, who was the bishop at the time, just beginning to have grand ideas for Auckland Castle, 
said, well, okay, let's just make sure he's a good preacher and doing all the day job stuff. But as soon as he arrives in 1754, the first season he's up here, he's bundled off to Auckland Castle to produce a landscape plan for what he wants to do there. Um, and he does that, he does Raby too. He does a whole series of, of uh, houses around in the county, uh, Sedgefield Rectory, uh, bah, 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 Ferry Hill for, for the Bulby family, uh, Ferry Hill Hall. Uh, his own estate in Durham was Balassis, Durham School. I think that's gone. He did things at Finkel as well. And he advised at Cochrane because he was right across the river from Cochrane where the car, the young Ralph Carr, was just beginning, a young man, 20s, I think. He married one of the veins from Raby and he would got the money and he was doing vast things to change a formal landscape into an informal landscape. Um, and what uh, Arthur Young says about Cochin, I think it's very relevant to Durham Peninsula, he says that basically Cochin had all the elements. It had some dramatic rocks, it had views, it had Finkel Priory, your ready-made perfect ruin, which every 18th century landscape designer wanted. It was there, you just had to get to it. And so Cock and spent, uh, Ralph Carr spent a lot of time creating riverside paths. Now, if you go and see them, you can, you, when you go across the bridge at Finkel, you're walking along Ralph Carr's path. And if you think about it, you're building 10, 15 foot of stone wall embankment against the rocks to create a level walk. And that goes right the way back towards Cock and Hall itself. Uh, this is quite expensive. It's not uh, dramatic in, in, in a decorative sense. There aren't any wonderful sculptural uh, details, but it's a lot of money. It's the access that gets to these views. And, and without that, you won't get the framed view of Finkel, which is what everybody wanted. And this is what they were creating. This print is now at Anik. But that's what that kind of embankment is what Cochrane was, was all about. These are the rocks which originally just stood straight out of the river. Uh, and now he came the last perambulation of, around Cochrane that Carr created, as advised by um, Spence, we now know, because we've seen a letter by Spence which shows him having walked around the Cochrane estate scribbling ideas, um, is, that the, is that view closed uh, of Finkel Priory in the same way that Studley Royal, you finish with Fountains Abbey. Um, and that's the house and that's the little bay window that Spence added on the side. And this is what you get, you see. And this is sublime. This is slightly scary. Um, the sublime has a kind of Victorian manifestation when you go out on a pier you know, it wouldn't be in your crinolines, perhaps, when you can go out into a pier in a storm and the world is crashing around you, it's pretty scary, but you know you're safe. Well, you know you're safe here, but you've got these overhanging rocks and so on. I suppose the 20th century equivalent and the nearest one I can think of is, is the National Glass Centre at Sunderland. You know, you walk up that roof and then you, oh my God, I'm on glass. And it's exciting and slightly scary. And you think you're safe because nobody's ever gone through two inches of glass before, but that's that same agreeable horror Arison, and, and that was the new dimension that they were looking for in 18th century landscapes. And you have that in around the peninsula. He lived here, Spence, this is his house. He almost certainly designed these railings. I won't go into all that, but that was his home in the college. Um, and he probably was responsible for starting the tree planting below the castle because there was no tree planting. You've got to remember there were the terrace gardens elsewhere. Michael Tooley, this is my little prompt for Michael Tooley. Michael Tooley, who was the only person I know who's been to Yale, where the Spence Archive is, and has gone through them all, uh, he says he's seen some evidence that Spence was responsible for recommending the planting to soften the views below the castle. I've looked, and, and there, I mean, I've not been, I tried to get to Yale, but because I was too old and didn't have a doctorate, I couldn't get in there. And they don't even do accommodation for students as if we're out of vacation. I ended up possibly having to book a a motel about five miles away. Anyway, but I'd love to go to look at these Spence papers. Um, there is, however, a block of Spence documents which are unknown, unidentified landscapes, unidentified uh, uh, descriptions, that are all bundled together. And by good fortune, a friend of mine got a copy of these digitally, so I suppose I don't really need to know, but uh, there are some interesting Durham things in there. But Michael says that he, he actually remembers seeing something which related to, uh, to, my, to uh, Spence uh, uh, proposing this, and I've, I've gone through the chapter act book, which is a sort of weekly or is it monthly meetings uh, that the chapter has when people like Spence, certainly during the summer, would be in attendance, uh, and I can't find anything. Maybe I've missed something, but um, it's it, it, I probably need to converse with Michael again. Um, what there is in that 30, 40 uh, documents which are unidentified. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful Durham garden. I mean, Dur Spence normally did a plan and a key. And annoyingly, there is, a, a, there is a, a document in there with a detailed garden design and no drawing. 
<laughs> mentions Black Hill, which is the only thing, a uh, view to Black Hill. Where's the Black Hill? There's a Black Hill in County Durham. But anyway, there is a landscape somewhere which Spence designed, perhaps, and was executed. Uh, but this is almost certainly, this is unidentified, but clearly Gillygate, Elbert Gate, Newbridge, Previns Bridge, Rounding Walk by Quarry is at the Dell, Miller's Gate, well, we've got a couple of mills, and interesting things like Pan's Cave, which are part of these little objects in the landscape that were perhaps created where the, where the, the, the rocks were formed. But he's, he's working out a load of path lengths, and it seems to be part of possibly opening up new paths around the peninsula to link views together, I don't know. It, they seem to go in succession. I mean, that, that he says is half a mile, and whether one can construct a series of lengths, I mean, it's a bit of research needed here, but a, a, I think that's Durham, put it that way. Uh, and it's interesting that he, he didn't attend one meeting when they were proposing new paths. And I wonder, I've suffered from this in the Northumbria Gardens Trust, if you don't go to a meeting, you get a job given to you, don't you? you know, if you're a committee member, always go and, and then resist being treasurer or chairman or secretary or whatever. If you, if you don't go, they'll elect you and say, well, he can do that. I wonder if, because Spence didn't go to this particular chapter meeting, that they voted him in to measure all the paths around the country. <laughs> um, and then this comes along. Um, amazingly, um, the, the flood and the bridge position is moved from here to here. Now, I had a long discussion with a gentleman called Mr. Hay. He was the son of Councillor Bill Hay, who used to be in Gilesgate many years ago, and he was a water engineer. And he said, well, if this had fallen down, and I said, well, sure, you, you could have rebuilt it on the same base. I imagine the base wasn't washed away, but you could just rebuild the piers. And I, I was arguing that the reason they moved to the new position, this position, is to create that, is to create, everything comes together once that bridge is in position, the viewpoints and everything works. And from here, if you stand on the abutment, which you can do here, you see absolutely nothing but the backside of, of the peninsula, just a row of, uh, just, just the trees at the back of St. Cuthbert's. You get no view of the Castle Cathedral at all. So they're doing that for aesthetic reasons. He said, no, he said, well, not necessarily. He said, because the currents here would be faster on the tight bend. And with the experience of having them washed away, they might have decided if they placed the bridge here, then the currents would not be so fast and less liable to be demolished in a future flood. It could be both. I, I'm aesthetically, though, and I think this is, takes priority. Uh, creating the Prevens Bridge on this position makes everything worse, worth work, rather. You stand at the far side of, of Prevens Bridge where the Scott words are, and you know, it's like going to Disneyland and seeing photo opportunity being waved at you in a bright sign. You're meant to, you are meant to stand there because everything works. Uh, of course, what works is that. Uh, you have the view closed. This is one of, of Lorraine's paintings closed by the bridge of Framelgate, and of course it works the other way, Framelgate looking uh, other way, uh, Prevence closes the view. Uh, you have obviously the, the, the buildings, you have the dramatic landscape, and you use the trees to soften and frame. What's happening, I think, and, and this is a fairly recent photograph, is that because of felled trees and fallen trees, what is missing, and what's certainly part of the counterpoint of the 18th century landscape, is that there should be, you should be able to see the fully, fully mill quite clearly as a counterpoint to, to the cathedral. Um, let's not forget this. Thank you again, Roger, because Roger wrote a little paper, I think it was in Rosemary Cramp's Fest Shift, wasn't it, uh, on this little building, which I just didn't know it existed, but there is an amazing drawing in the Dean chapter in the Cathedral Library of this building, which of course there are still elements of, if you go along the riverbanks, you can still see this side of it, uh, and the churchyard wall to, to the south side of St. Oswald, you can count the windows. Uh, this is the view from New Inn end, as it were, on the south side, don't know whether quite there was many windows as this. I, I mean, there's an awful lot. And this was drawn much later. This building lasted eight years. And, and if it would survive today, people would say, oh, Durham, yes, cathedral, castle, viaduct, cotton mill. That, you know, it would be that sort of big. It, it was massive. You know, think, think of the things you get in Macclesfield and, and quarry banks and so on. Uh, and it burned down in, in eight years. But remember, it was, it was, it was looming over the riverbanks of all the, uh, of Elvis. And of course, in the foreground, nicely, we have a little coal mine. Uh, one of the things, this is on Anchorage site, there was some on the Science Lab site, uh, and there was some uh, on, on Durham School site, on Balassis. So these little things were dotted around very close into the riverbanks. And of course, um, if you go with uh, Brian Young, he'll show you where the, the coal still outcrops just beyond Prevens Bridge. Um, 1806. Um, Chad's lower gardens, they, they, they were taken into, I mean, they're obviously, they were, they were shown as an orchard in the, uh, uh, in, in, the um, in the book drawing as a single orchard, 
but the individual owners, or rather the seas of the six properties south of Bow Lane, take possession of this and divide them up. Um, and this is the 1857 uh, OS map, wonderful map, as I say, and, and, and believe in every one of these tree stamps. This is not a, a, a Royal Engineer or a survey staff thinking, oh, on an idle lunchtime, we're just going around stamping trees anywhere. Every one of these trees is accurately plotted, at least in my experience, when one has looked for trees, they're, they're where you expect to find them. Here's the castle wall and the lower gardens. Interestingly enough, uh, here, that, an odd combination of individual gardens clearly divided up, and yet they're allowed to walk between them. They have their own zigzagging, or zigzagging down the slope, but they're allowed to pass into their neighbor's garden. So I think this is an example of six high status, semi-gentry owners feeling they were quite happy to be able to walk into each other's gardens to see to share an expansive landscape but still have their own plot clearly delineated down the riverbanks uh, and two good examples of 1806 plus you know 1808 1810 railings uh, look at the railings around that semicircular garden at the top of crown courts at old velvet which is 1810 1811 a very similar design you know uh, uh, to these and this is the infirmer's garden at, um, old velvet uh, at um, uh, North Bailey. And then we get this interesting building, of course, the Count's house, not the Count. He lived at uh, Kalamanko, uh, a house lived in by the Ebden sisters, and he looked after him. But by the fact that he was short and this little building, people thought this was the Count's house. It was simply a summer house for the Shibbertsons who lived here. And I think because, you see, they're cut off. As, as the Edens were, by the massive Bowes Garden. The Bowes took a great chunk, so you couldn't get individual householders taking a chunk because the Bowes Garden, which is now all St. John's, cuts right behind them. Yet they wanted, because it was fashionable in the early 19th century, to expand and go down into the lower uh, gardens and do, um, do an informal landscape, a romantic landscape. So what they did, they bought this property, or seemed to at least, I mean, I'm putting together the fact that they bought the property next door and leased it, and when you look at the 1857 map, there is, and you can see it here, there is a narrow cut where they retained access from their garden into this corner, and they got hold of this chunk from the Dean and Chapter of the Riverbanks. Um, and they put their cottage here, their summer tea house, down right by the river, and they did a, a lovely um, uh, ice house here. And this is it. Uh, and if you read Hutchinson, and you read any account of a, a mid to late 18th century landscape, what they're always going on about, in looking for the sublime is rocks uh, and talon rooted oak trees clinging to the rocks. Well, this is a great photograph which shows it is from, it's not my photograph, it's from the book, a uh, university book, uh, does exactly what they liked. It was slightly scary, it was sublime. And here's this sort of vaguely Roman tomb, Greek tomb, which is an ice house uh, in, the, in the, and you can still go, if you go around the back of the castle and just walk up there, I don't think St. Cuthbert would mind, um, you can still see it there part of that landscape, but a very ingenious way of getting to it, because the Shepherdsons were, Shepherdsons were desperate to have a, a lower garden. Just a looking at the 1857, which we have to take as gospel and accurate, I think we, we, it invariably is. Here's St Cuthbert's well, and there is a shaft of, of, of open space below it, so that when you were walking along the bottom, you would look up and see St Cuthbert's in a kind of alley framed at the top of the, the bank. St Cuthbert's Well, of course, which was restored uh, well, when I was in Durham, so we're talking 1990s, I think, uh, with a little, when this path was opened up, John Williams was involved with it, very laudable scheme, and, uh, and indeed there was, there was very little vegetation below, so the possibility of framing that much better uh, was all there. Uh, and then I think there was a collapse, wasn't there? There was something happened on the bank. I think the, the path collapsed, a, a slippage after a, a rain, and they closed St Cuthbert's Well, and it's been closed ever since. But I mean, they actually did the fabric repairs. But what's interesting is this. I mean, this is an area of clear trees. This is coming down uh, uh, Windy Gap. And as you came down Windy Gap, you've seen right across to South Street with no obstruction of trees. I, I can't think what else. It's an odd thing, because I mean, there isn't a particular feature on, ice, on South Street. I don't think you could see St Margaret's Church Tower. I don't know, I don't know what, they're, what they're doing this for. I wonder whether it's something to do with the boundary here, because what, is it walking the bounds? Is it being able to inspect the bounds? But there's a clear cut in the trees to look across to South Street, uh, or, or indeed to look back, but there's nothing to look back at. I mean, cathedral and castle are either side, so that needs explaining in some way. On the South Street side, because South Street now, the, 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 the trees below South Street are, are in, the, in danger of a, spoiling the views for South Street residents to the extent that I remember many of them were converting their attics just so they could see over the trees. 
And I do remember one memorable walk with John Williams, the Dean of Chapter. We just happened to be walking along South Street. And at least two residents came out and said, oh, Mr. Williams, I wonder if you could possibly just chop that branch there, just take that off, because it's spoiling my view of the West Front. Um, which, and John was very reluctant to do it. And, and he was a National Trust tree man of origins originally. And if you stand on the axis of the West Front, and you've got what I call Miss Wilkinson's house behind you, the uh, wonderful lady who lived in that big house on the axis, and she had a wonderful first floor room that had that oriel that looked on the axis. There was a wonderful beech tree that John thought was a really good specimen bang in the way. And it was a lovely beech tree. And it is a lovely beech tree because it's still there and you can't see the West Front before because of it. But there is an argument, I would say, for, for having shafts um, a la, a la uh, Revo Terrace. John said, I'll put another, another view in. And there is a view, in fact, further along. But here, of course, you have the view, a constrained, a constricted view. You've got the southern area of, of coming up to Pimlico tight woodland, so spatially rather nice experience. And you still get it, of course. You walk along here, then suddenly the view opens out and, and, and there's the west front uh, to, your, to your right. And below, you've got an orchard, so you're never going to get any trees of any substance here that are coming to any height. Um, and that, I think, we're, we've lost with a sort of more general woodland cover now. The only introduction to the peninsula really was uh, and the, the only uh, intruder into the gradual thinning out of buildings on the uh, uh, outside the castle wall uh, was Crudders House, which was put in in 1913, uh, St. John's College. It's the only, I say, intruder. It, it stands where there's a very interesting little entrance to a kind of grotto building, whether it's an ice house or what. But the, uh, you go on the back now, it's, it's still there. And I, it's, I, well, I don't know, as Richard, have you investigated it? Because Richard, you did yeah. the Castle Walls, didn't you? Is, is, is it, does it open out into a sort of domed, is it yeah, a nice it house? Is. It's a very, very flat dome. Right. It's very wide though, it's, it's much larger than the other ice houses. So whether grotto is a bit of a romantic attribution, it's, you'd expect a grotto to be covered in, you know, shells and all the rest of it. And whether it just be a practical ice house, I don't know, but it's, it's uh, and then, for the record, St. John's tried to get another building outside the walls. I mean, when, when before they built the Leech Hall, which was inside, um, they asked, first of all, they had a, a, a series of sketches showing buildings dotted on the riverbanks because they thought if they'd got crudders, they were entitled to have another one. Mm -hmm. um, I remember we had a long meeting with Ruth Etchell about that. Um, and she provided lunch. And of course, in St. John's provide lunch and then says, can we have buildings outside the walls? But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to say no to something like that because Crudus exists. It's, it looks quite nice from the, uh, the gardens, but it really shouldn't have set a precedent for more buildings outside the walls. It was a possible exception of a bridge. Uh, and that's Kingsgate and Dunelm, which we're hopefully are safe. We don't know, do we? Or maybe somebody can tell me whether Dunelm has it any safer than, uh, since it was listed. But uh, a great view taken uh, for an architectural press soon after the construction in the 60s. Final thoughts. Um, quickly, I mean, the, the point I'm making is this is not an accidental bit of woodland that's just, just emerged. It's got an incredibly rich history, and we always use this word palimpsest about landscapes, layered history, and it's all there. And so it's planned, it's, it's maintained, it's been managed for various different functions, and the functions are shifting over time. It deserves to be registered as a nationally significant historic park and gardens. And Jennifer White, who, if you remember, was the partner of Chris Higgins, um, uh, Vice Chancellor. She, before she left Durham, registered it with English Heritage, now Historic England, on their kind of books to register it. I mean, it's not coming up as urgent because there's no proposals that are really threatening it, unless you know differently perhaps in current lights. But that's why it's sitting there to be done at some point. Uh, in the same way, there are lots of buildings. Are, there's no current threat. It's there on the list. She's very keen to see it registered. She thought it deserved it. And if she's an expert on historic gardens, uh, I'm very happy to, to agree with her. The logic of including it in, a, in a, an extension to the World Heritage Site seems very sensible to me. I remember when I was here and when I was at EH, there was, there was brief discussion about simply treating the river as the logical extension to, to, to uh, the World Heritage Site, which is really the craziest thing you could possibly imagine. It's like saying, well, I think Durham Cathedral is terribly good and deserves to be a World Heritage Site. Let's just take the right-hand side of the nave. You know, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Spatially, it is one, and the outer ring of the riverbanks is logical. There was a riverbanks management plan. I don't know what happened to it. It was meant to be reviewed every five years. It was set up, city council, county council, dean of chapter, university, any others, Johns, Johns and Chads and so on. Um, and I don't know what happened to it, but that was meant to be monitoring and managing the, the process uh, of, of how it, uh, and, and any 
judicious and selective felling, as I said, uh, which is now long overdue. I think of Hardwick, the development of Hardwick Park by Tony, Tony Smith and Durham County Council, Tony masterminded it, and he was tearing his hair out because they had an arboriculturalist that said to you, there's a great bloke, but his job, as he saw it in his job description, was to save every tree in Central District Council. And when Tony said, well, in order to create the views that were originally designed at Hardwick, we need to fell so that we can see through. Um, this guy kind of resisted everyone. He came on board eventually, but it was really tough. And, and the same thing is happening at Auckland Castle, where Pitt Morrison is doing a landscape survey at the moment, and lots of views are being lost. lost. Uh, Joseph Spence's designs for vistas are being clouded out by, by Victorian planting. It's just grown up un un uncontrolled. There was a wonderful Riverbanks garden scheme. A lot of work was done for it. It fell at the first hurdle, this HLF. Um, is it dead or is it capable of resuscitation? It's quite complicated. It involved going in at the Count's house, basically, and walking through the lower gardens of Cuthbert's and John's, maybe eventually chaps to get you to Bow Lane, but initially at start at the southern end. And at the time, John's and Cuthbert's were on board to allow their lower gardens to be open in the summer because they're clearly, uh, you'd have to do something security-wise um, at the line of the castle wall, um, but they, they were generally sympathetic to the idea. Bishop's Walk and Prebens Walk, well, I mean, they're, they're, I think they're easy wins. I mean, I well, include Kings Against Postum, which is even easier. I mean, if, if the cathedral just cut the grass on Palace uh, on Prebens Walk, you could get it back to the way it was 10 years ago. Um, whether it can be then taken forward with a degree of public opening, a friend's project, Old Durham is a good exemplar. The, the way you do it is very easy to do. It's very low cost. I think that's a relatively easy win. You've got to tackle, and it may be the difficulty of, of, of security and, and uh, safeguarding of, of the, the chorister school, of course. Um, I think the castle are already on board. I know uh, some conversations I've had with Gemma that they're very keen to do something. They agree that North Terrace is deeply embarrassing and that once this major excavation to open up and then dry out the north wall of the chapel happens, they are looking to re-landscaping that because it's just totally overgrown. Uh, and as, as well, of course, it was allowed, a lot of trees were allowed to grow up on the slope. Um, King's Eight Poston, well, we could do it this afternoon if it's still light outside and somebody's got a saw, we can saw that tree down. Well, Dennis and I can do it on the way back. <laughs> I, I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, you know, 13 years on and exactly the same thing is going to happen. I think there's a lot more steel work in that, but somebody should take responsibility. If you give it to solicitors, they might take 10 years to decide, is it the Dean and Chapter, is it the Bishop, is it, the, is it Hatfield, is it can't count it. It's, it's, it's about the size of this, this desk. You know, we could clear it in the afternoon. Uh, somebody take that tree out before next spring, otherwise the roots will still start to push out that uh, postern. And it's a vitally important thing. Yes? Um, I don't know if you know that the Albert Residence Association have done some of that research about oh. roots because there's going to be a bench in honour of Janet Hill. Oh, lovely. Um, so it is highways. Oh, they, good. They're supposed to be ice the bridge and get the Oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Well, I mean, I, I mean, Jed Lawson at the county was very, he, he was of that view. You could put a seat yeah. there and so on. You, you'd want to clear the vegetation yeah. so you can see the, see the stuff behind. Oh, great. Well, there you go. Solved. No need, no need for the, you don't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. Is the tree still there? <laughs> I, didn't, I should have spotted it on my way across. Um, and I, I don't know anything about the current proposals. I think I was last engaged when somebody involved, my, my wife and I, this must be over 11 years ago, on, on the Necklace Park, which was one another great scheme that kind of vaguely vanished into the ether. Oh, I was going to finish off with the, the last photograph of the, of the the painting. Anyway, there you go. That was very rapid. Uh, thank you for sticking with me, and I hope that was useful. Martin's happy to take questions following that fascinating talk. Unfortunately, the technology doesn't allow questions from people who are watching from home, but we had hoped to make that possible. It hasn't proved possible. But anyone here, welcome to ask questions. Adrian. Thanks, Martin. That was terrific. Um, just a couple of things. On the gazebo below Jack's house up Silver Street. Yeah. Do you think that might have been a privy? Well, yes. <laughs> I hate to spoil the yeah. tea party, No, 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 you're right. I, I'm going by pretty middle route. Right, okay. sure. You're quite right. And in fact, the view opposite is not that spectacular, is it, really? And you mentioned the quarrying for peasants library. Would that have been the actual? <coughs> finished stone on the outside or the construction? I don't know, but it, I meant to show up. I'm going to go back. I don't know, uh, which one was it? 
there you see that this that's is that is that and i've never spotted this before there's a, there's a quarry in there i can't remember when you walk along there whether that's it i think there's something about him coming quite close into the wall and he's been kind of advised by whom i don't know who would dare advise because of the stop but anyway that um but he couldn't be bothered to get it from anywhere else <laughs> he's sort of right underneath me i'll just take it from here the, the quality of the library stone if you compare it to the old down school what's now the music department mm. one's shoddy stone for the school and one's really smart stone for the library I Brian Young is the man to ask, I guess, on that. Uh, it used to be John Senior, didn't it? We always used to ask about stone in Durham and where the sources were, but I think Brian Young might know. But yes, I, uh, but I, I'm always a bit wary of Bishop Cousin because when he was doing paths around the castle and he wanted to do some gravel, he, he dug up, he got his men to dig up Palace Green, where it was pibble sand, I think, and just shove in rubbish and then put a bit of pibble sand back over the top. So if he found a cheap way of doing something, he would he would use local local sourcing. It's it's, it's obviously ticks a box now. <laughs> yeah. Um, not a question, but I can add a little bit of information about uh -huh. Shipperton, Edward Shipperton. The little strip of land he did indeed buy from the neighbouring property uh, in order to connect up the back of his house with that. Uh, of land, which actually he acquired not from the dean and chapter but from the bishop. Oh, right. It was uh, it was a piece of land known as the Pen Pinfold Close, where in medieval times people would bring their animals to be penned before they were taken into market. Oh, in Spain, and he, Shippenson, initially leased it from the bishop and then bought it from the bishop, and. Um, the, the little house is particularly interesting because whether it was ever a summer house or not, I don't know. But certainly by 1850, uh, Edward Shippenson's groom was living in it along with his wife and three children. Good Lord. And it remained a house until 1938. I mean, it was a tea house. I've seen a photograph of it being a tea house. Isn't that in the. That's right. well, the, the People who ran into the tea house lived in it. Gosh. And it was occupied right up until 1938. I mean, so, so the, the close below the walls was, was owned by the bishop, yes, not, not yes, the chapter. Yeah, right, right. That piece of land that you had marked off. Yeah. That was in full close. I mean, the little, the, the little strip that links the two, I think what he did, he, he bought that or leased from, the from next, next door and then, then detached a section and said, You're not having this That's strip, not. this is for me. Yeah. And the little sort of turret area that mm. you saw the, at the end of that strip of land was the base of that two-story tower house that it would, was in the yes building. it would yeah. be interesting to know the dates of the leasing and the purchase because I mean, Bonamy is the obvious man to have designed I, I the council. All those details are told. Oh, right. Well, I mean, uh, because, I mean, if you're leasing, you maybe you're not clear whether you want to build, and maybe when you own, you would build, you know what I mean? But, well, I mean, it's just from an architectural history point of view. Bonamy was doing Greek revival ahead of quite a lot of people. The real Greek revival thing was being done at Belsé and the Moot Hall in, in Newcastle, the first decade of the 18th, 19th century for... Well, say the real pioneering building, and then the Moot Hall, the Stokoe's doing that, and then Bonamy gets it, and he's doing all the buildings around where the Northgate was, around the, where Hayton and Braddock's office were, and the Salvation Army. Good Greek revival stuff, and that's 1820s, we know. So just, and so he's the obvious person, because it's quite accomplished Greek revival, the Count's house, uh, and uh, it would be, he'd be the obvious person. He's got his office on the Bailey, I think, somewhere on well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Purpose. Um, uh, quickly, I, I heard um, uh, Johnson say that the Chad's Riverside Garden was one of the very earliest quarries. Oh, right. On your map. right. No, I don't, I'm not aware of I me mean, quarrying it from the bottom. Isn't that mm. interesting? It, well, it doesn't show up certainly on the 1857, which is the only one. I mean, there, there, well, you can just see the top of it on the um, on the Bock one, but then you only just see the top, and it's just shown as sort of furry, rough ground, and that's why I'm a bit doubtful of it at Hatfield. Um, but certainly, um, when Buck comes along in the 1720s, he seems to have suggested it's all gardens, but, but it may well be at the bottom. It's, it's a big expanse of gardens, but and it's perfectly possible, and, it, and it's owned by the Priory, it's run by the Priory before that, so it could well have been excavated. Yeah, 
Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. And I invite Sue Childs to give a formal vote of thanks to, to Martin for that wonderful talk. Right, thank you. Um, a number of people in the, in the trust, myself included, were involved with the neighborhood plan for Durham City. And when we had the initial consultations where we asked people what was important to them, second to the castle and the cathedral were the river and the riverbanks. It's incredibly important to the people who live in the city. So your talk has been wonderful. It's been fascinating. It's been authoritative. It's been detailed. And what I take from it, as well as the historical information and these marvelous images that you've shown, is that the history is still relevant to us today. And I take up the point that the riverbanks has been, um, it's a living landscape. It means um, it's been used for different purposes, for different people, and that's still relevant today. And John has mentioned at the beginning that there's a group of people discussing what should be done with the, um, with the riverbanks. And I think you've already alluded to something that people's views may be different because I think the riverbanks now are a wild landscape, aren't they? I don't know if that's got, deliberate or not, or whether it's... No, I think it's just happened, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, that's what I think the point yes. I'm making, you need some truth. Exactly. So and, you've got and people... Some views need to be reopened. Yes, yeah, so you've got the issue, you mentioned the person where there was a, a difference between whether or not they wanted to have that beach tree in place for a, for a nature yeah. point of view or remove it for an a aesthetic point of view. So we're talking about those kind of views about the, the landscape. Mm. And you mentioned that it's a planned landscape. Absolutely. And that's very important, I think, because of the purpose of the trust is to deal with planning proposals and to lobby for the benefit of the preservation, conservation and uh, appropriate and well-designed future, future development for the city. And there is um, some policies inside the neighbourhood plan about protecting the riverbanks. And one of them in particular is that it's now a local green space, which gives it the same level of protection as the green belt. And um, I think um, you've talked, you've given us at the end some ideas about how we can preserve and conserve what is there and improve it. So I'd like to thank Martin, I'd like us all to thank Martin for such a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. It's now time just for a few quick commercials. If, if anyone doesn't happen to be a member of the Trust already, I've got some application forms with me. And Matthew Phillips here is happy to sell Christmas cards, Trust Christmas cards. And if he's not got the ones that you want, he'd, he'd take orders as well. Uh, if anybody isn't a member of the Trust and hasn't received the bulletin, which I showed at the beginning, which has all the information in about activities on the riverbanks. If you simply email chair at durhamcity.org, I'll send you one. And I'll just finish with a, a concluding thanks to everybody and wish you all a very happy Christmas and New Year. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah.